This is pretty. Ah, uh, yes. Good morning, everybody. It is a lovely Wednesday, Thursday morning. I mean, this week has just gone, gone so quickly. I feel like I've missed a day. Thursday morning. <laughs> you know it's a Thursday because you can see Pumi Mashiko, you can see Bagabantu, and you can see me. And later on, in order to make absolutely sure, you don't have to look at your calendar, you know, because the burning platform is on. That's how you know it's a Wednesday. Ah, uh, yeah. It's a Thursday. I mean, you keep geez, saying Wednesday. <laughs> so, so what's, what's going on with me, Pums? Do you, think I've got a, a uh, you think I've got a brain illness? Do you think there's something uh, happening in my head? Maybe it's, it's, it's like a hang long on, hang on, COVID. Oh. Yeah, it's all that <laughs> blood you were putting in your head. It's too much all blood. That, what I, yeah, yes, Pum. Did I, uh, did I tell you about yesterday? Um, I mean, the yeah, day before yesterday when I went for my, my vampire facial. Oh, no, you're joking. You did that. I did it for me. I did it. It was, Why? It was... Why? Well, okay. So look at me now. Already, already like back to normal color. But, but you're the still skin... a bit pink. You're still yeah, a bit but, pink. But for me, the skin will be... Wait till you see me. The next time you see me at the office, you'll think, oh, this guy is three to five years younger than when I last saw him. And you won't know why. Well, now you will, but other people won't. <laughs> she's probably she, got angry. She's just disappointed. She just gave like just a sigh. Like, why don't you like it? <laughs> why don't you like it? Oh, everything about it is, you know, mm. the, the way it looks, the way they do it, you know. Yeah, they get your blood and then they spin it in a centrifuge. And then they put it back into your skin with a gun with little tiny spikes in it. It's unbelievably cruel. I mean, it's it's like a medieval torture. Um, what did it did it feel painful? What they Could do you is feel they, the... they put a they put a numbing thing on you, and you, you you sit there for literally twenty minutes while the stuff starts to work. But while they while you're doing that, they you do they take your blood. And and I mentioned this yesterday on the show, and you mentioned it again because you're asking. Um, but the first vial broke in the centrifuge. So they had to take more blood from me and they took from the other side. So they started on this side and they went to this side. So I had to give like, I don't know, it must have been about five liters by the end of it. <laughs> well, it felt like it. Um, but I'm telling you, the stuff works. We're going to get that woman on one morning and she can explain how it works and why it works. I think it's the old principle of if you don't, go through and endure something difficult, you don't grow and you don't learn. Now, your skin must be the same. That if your skin is uh, constantly coddled and looked after and never exposed to anything horrible, it just doesn't get any better. Now, obviously, the, the, the exception to that is the sun because the sun just does long-term damage. But, um, I mean, you don't have to worry because black don't crack, right? We had this conversation mm -hmm. with Simpua yesterday. You don't although, have to worry. Although, Gareth, you, you know, I've been um, I've been listening and reading a lot of Ali Mazrui in the past couple of days. Who's Ali Mazrui? <laughs> Come on, oh, share ask. your secrets. Is this your is this your, is this your, <laughs> your shaman? No, <laughs> he is actually he, he is actually a very well known Kenyan born academic professor, political writer, um, Islamic studies, North African, oh. North-South relations. He's wow. like, like the, in, on, on YouTube, there is a series that he did with, with the BBC many years ago, kind of, I think in the 70s already, about Africa. It's called The Africans. He wrote a, four volumes of a book about the Africans and just kind of pre, all the way from kind of pre-colonial history and etymology of stuff and cultures and, and, and how the melting pot that is Africa was, is, and seems to be going. That sounds, that sounds really interesting. And you know how much I love history. Now I'm gonna have to go and find, I'm gonna go and have to find this book and start reading it myself. That's yeah. what's gonna happen. It's called the Africans, um, and you spell his name M A Z R U I Mazrui. Okay, good. I've got it written down. I'm on it. So why did you <laughs> why did you bring Mazrui up with regard to like black don't crack? Perfection. Why miss 
with <laughs> oh, you mean, okay, but but I mean, but that would be like saying, well, you know, we shouldn't really develop antibiotics because nature's perfect already, and if you get sick, well, maybe that's nature. Yeah. Great. You reckon? And look, that's that's uh, uh, what 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 is what is being fixed. Let it be fixed. But I'm just kind of going. One of the things, and I've told you the story about my grandmother and refusing to get um, a pacemaker, is. One of the things that I'm okay with mm. is the process of aging, right? It's the process of, of getting older. It's the process of like getting lines on my forehead or on my like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, like I'm okay with that. But, but isn't it a negotiation? It's not an either or. And I'm glad that I'm having this conversation with you because Bhagavantu understands none of this. He's too young and look at him, he's got pimples still. I know he doesn't. <laughs> So he's, he's still a child and he didn't care about the answers to this, but I know there are many people listening who do. So, you know, Bhagavan, if you can restrain yourself from getting bored, here's the point <laughs> I want to make about that. I, I kind of agree. And you are one of those people. And, and this is not some sideways compliment because I've known you a long time. Um, you, you've got better and better with age. And I would like to think that I'm also one of those people, but there's certain stuff you can do and which it's appropriate to do something about, like staying in shape. And I mean, because you could just let yourself go. Nature take its course, become lazy. And you could go for, you know, huge amounts of surgery and Botox and end up looking like a, like a, like a waxwork. But somewhere, <laughs> in between, somewhere in between is like main, maintenance stuff. So you're not changing your appearance and you're not trying to fiddle with nature, but you are working with nature in some ways. Because again, if I take the processes of building muscle, of, um, of, of having one of these facial things so that your skin rejuvenates itself, so it works a bit harder, of kind of going for LASIK treatment so you don't have to look through glasses the whole time, those sorts of things are, and, and getting your teeth straightened and stuff like that, which nature can be bugger all help with. I think those are good things to do because otherwise… I mean, otherwise we just get we get back we go backwards very quickly, right? I think I was gonna raise the exercise argument. Like, exercise is a way of trying to keep yourself young. Like, it's proven. Yo, so if you exercise I, earlier, you age better. I am not against doing any of that stuff. It's all <laughs> about the trade off, right? It's about yeah. what you're willing to trade off. So, like the the vampire facial. That, that's a that's a lot of trade off, right? It's like needles sure. up your arm. It's numb, a whole numb face. It's it's a lot to trade off for some people. For other people, so, it ain't no that. Right? I'll admit. I mean, like I was I was already I was trying to back out of it <clears throat> because I thought <laughs> no only only because like I'm not afraid of pain because I don't think I mean I don't have the highest pain threshold in the world, but I'm not one of those people who's like spends life trying not to. Um, not to get myself into uh, slightly complex circumstances. In other words, I, I like a bit of a challenge. And I often think about people in past generations and the things they've been through and how much harder <laughs> their lives were than ours. And I often, you know, like when, when I once had a car accident and I was bleeding, went to the hospital and they had to, I had a big cut here and they had to inject right into it. And I just thought about my two grandfathers who were like, fighting a war and i'm like what the hell this is just a needle in a hospital i'll be fine i'll get over this and the same thing happened with this but i was already too far in i couldn't then turn around and get out of there and you were two vials in gareth <laughs> i was two vials in correct i was it was too late to turn around so it, it didn't feel like a huge th plus i mean some <laughs> some people uh wish they could have those treatments and here i am getting it and and paying for it and i'm loving it and I like the result. And sometimes you have to go through a bit of pain to get the result. And that's, you see, that, that, that's, that's really all that matters, right? Do you, do you mind what you have to go through to get the result? No. You no. like the result? You, you want what you get on the other side? Well, I mean, I also only have, to, <laughs> I only have to do it like once or twice every two years. So that's not too bad. As, as a, and you know what? If it does make me look less ancient and uh, terrible, then I, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> the pursuit for immortality. <laughs> but, uh, while, we're on, while we're on this issue of immortality, I heard about this story, and it's something you actually raised the last time we were on the show, is this guy who got the pig heart. 
You know, he got the genetically altered pig mm. heart put in him. Mm. But he died. He died this week, right? Yeah, on Tuesday. Two no. months. Two months after the... And, and I mean, two months is a long time. It's a big kind of a bonus. moving forward. It's a, look, it's also a big moving forward for, as we're talking about, kind of the longevity of life and whatever. Sure. But pig heart, hey? It was genetically modified, suppressing some of the genes um, yeah. in the heart so that it would stop growing when they put it in him. Um, and also so that the body wouldn't reject it completely, you know, and then right. they injected it with a couple of, I think, four uh, human chromosomes to, it's a hell of a thing. It's a hell of a thing. And I think, like, so right now, they're still going to do it. Obviously, they, they're going to have to do a post-mortem to see what exactly mm -hmm. it is that went wrong. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, he, well, it, the, the body was, wasn't was rejecting the organ and he seemed to be fine. Apparently, he was doing physiotherapy. He was talking and laughing, even watched the Super Bowl. That's cool. You know, bonus hey, time. Um, but, I mean, this is really Bakabantu's area of expertise because we were talking about what he does on what he, what he does for a real job. You know, he's got this internship at a lab. <laughs> for a real <laughs> job. <laughs> no, it is because, you know, come on. I mean, um, <laughs> Well, this could be my real job, Gareth. Like just shooting wow. it out there, Rena uh, Universe. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's see, but first, carry on trying to find cancer. That's far more important. Oh. No, uh, no, people, but like people say to me, oh, I want to be in uh, in media. I want to be on 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 television or online. I want to be doing this. I said, no, we've got enough people who want to do that. Go and become a doctor or a scientist. We need those engineers. Uh, you know, doctor in the making one. Day. Lawyers, it's lawyers. We don't, we don't need no more lawyers. That's one thing we don't need. But. This is something you know a little bit about because when we talk about chromosomes and, and, and manipulating DNA, I mean, you watch that happen under a microscope. You watch these things yeah, actually I, take place. I was going to raise that like pigs, genetically speaking, are like, they are very close variant to human skin. Like we already, we've already been doing this with insulin. Uh, that's how we produce mm. insulin. Uh, that's and that's why like certain like religions, especially like Muslim people, can't take insulin because it's legit. Uh -huh. Take the insulin gene we put it in pig cells and then the pig cells replicate. And then that's when, then we extract the insulin again. So like, right. yeah, Muslims and the halal thing doesn't match up, but yeah, we've already been doing this with pigs. Like, yeah. So like also like screen grafts have been done with certain pigs and like certain pig skin. So they pretty, they're pretty close genetic match, if that makes sense. So it also makes sense. Like the taking out of the chromosomes that so, Pumi was mentioning to so not that, reject. That Pumi, as Pumi says then, <clears throat> this is a major achievement. I mean, to give yeah. someone an extra two years of, I mean, two months of life doesn't seem like a lot to us because, I mean, I can't even remember New Year. Um, and that was three months, well, two and a half months ago. Um, it's, it is a huge achievement in science that we're able to do this. And obviously there are ethical considerations and there are, you know, people who have... Yeah, I mean, there were, so in order to even get the transplant done, they, they had to get like an emergency kind of passed off by the FDA, you know, in America, mm. they have the FDA. Right. So they had to, and, and that literally was signed on New Year's Eve. And then a week later, he was able to get the transplant. So. But what it does also mean is, as, and I'm sure South Africa is one of the countries that really struggles with this, is organ donors, right? So yeah. we know, we already know that a, a person that dies who's an organ donor can save seven, seven lives yeah. with mm -hmm. various organs from their body. But we don't have a lot of people who are willing to donate their organs. And Which so is why I donate blood. <laughs> I also also want to donate organ when I die, but like I, I put up my hand. I put up my hand because you're getting none of mine. I'm taking Wait. every one of them to the. <laughs> I'm taking every one of them in like canopic jars, like Tutankhamun did, all the way to the afterlife. You are getting not a single stitch, not a vial of not a thing. I'm a selfish son of a bitch. You want organs? Get them from someone somewhere else. <laughs> Guy, you're doing like vampire facials. You could give that skin away. You could no. give that skin away. What is it's wrong mine. with you? You're not getting <laughs> mine. You could have anyone else's you like, but you're getting none of my organs. Hell no. The idea that my organs could end up inside of someone who I have a moral and ethical problem with bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> 
you're a, what if you're a right wing lunatic or a or a left wing communist? Or what if you're a fat person and you end up with my skin? That's <laughs> an embarrassment for me. I mean, now imagine like, like a fat person ends up with your heart. <laughs> Oh, well, the what dark you, vacuum that is. What an life. abuse. You're dead. You're dead. I don't care. I'll come back and haunt those people. I, you watch me. I'm not giving anything. And just in case they don't want to be haunted, don't. I'm warning you now. With peace and love, I warn you, if you're listening to me this morning, this is a public announcement, a public service announcement. I, Gareth Cliff, swear to come back in whatever way I can, whether it's to rattle the plates in your kitchen or to throw things at you across the room or to turn your whole house into a shit show. <laughs> I will come back. If you take one of my organs with peace and love, I'm coming back to get you. I, I do Obviously not, not with peace and love. You're Mina, coming back with malice. Mina, I do not want to be recycled. Throw me <laughs> in the grave, all of it, at once, finish it up. I, I'm not sharing. I'm not. I'm selfish in that way. I'm not but sharing. There are, there are other it's people. Like a, what, if, what if someone, here's, is the worst, here's my worst case scenario. What if Someone, uh, and I'm an organ donor and I die in an accident or something and they, they get, harvest me, which I hate that word. They harvest me for all the shit that I can give. And let's say they say, all right, well, the heart's okay. He didn't smoke. Maybe the lungs we can use. Um, and then they look and they're like, mm, that's a, not a particularly useful penis. I think we could throw that away. What if they say <laughs> that? I'll be so offended in that moment. You'd be that dead. I, will, I don't You'd care. Be I'll dead. be back. <laughs> I'll be back. At that moment, just... You know what? I'm not giving any of it. I'm just find it from someone else, someone nice like Pumi, who cares about. Oh, a list of important organs to go. <laughs> the heart, no, lungs, the penis. liver, the lungs. And the penis. Well, I mean, yeah, Pumi, you discussed. So you say that you only. say that about you say that about people who get your organs. So the, mm. there was a bit of controversy about the guy who got the pig heart as well right yeah because it turns out that as everybody as you know how in america then they delve into when you were three years old mm. apparently um years ago i think about 15 years ago or so mm. he would no, no no so it might be even longer he was in an altercation and, and what they say in the paper in the new york times they say that it was a um jealousy fueled rage in huh. which he got into an altercation with another young man that he stabbed like 26 times wow and this is a guy who got a heart and <laughs> that guy he obviously needed a new heart that guy even if it's a mixed heart he needed a change of heart gareth well listen to this Michelle, and that guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Michelle, this is the, you see, this is the kind of shit that happens if you have no control. Michelle says, Gareth, my father had a heart transplant. It was adamant that he didn't want a black person's heart. The racist <laughs> ass died. Now that she, now she's talking about her own father, Michelle. But you see, this is why some people don't deserve your organs, Pumi, and you have no say on this. <laughs> the what the black heart. <laughs> mm -mm. Oh, <laughs> Listen, if, if people are prepared to take um, take hearts out of other animals that aren't even wow. human, can you imagine how stupid you'd have to be to not take a heart because it's a black person's heart? Also, I do kind of like the idea that there might be some of those uh, those those black person's thoughts and ideas and feelings and history because I always believe in the epigenetics, <laughs> right? And, and it might completely confuse a racist. Like, you don't tell a racist. You just give them the black heart. You know, if, if, if you could, you know, if you could uh, go back in time and you find a Nazi in Hitler's inner circle and you're like, they're, they're on the verge of death, and you give them like a Jewish person, whatever, lungs to, and then a little bit of that, uh, that Jewish history and that, and that Jewish heritage is in them. And it completely resets their clock. And then suddenly they're like, oh, my God, I'm having a crisis of conscience. Imagine that. That would be amazing. Or you do <laughs> tell them and torture them with knowing that as they are yes. alive, the reason yeah. they are alive is because, is that... come on, there are so many there are so many reasons why you could do this and why you sh should well, do this. And well, some look, of them. There are these moving stories, these beautiful stories about these people who do get an extra couple of years of life, maybe even a couple of, of maybe some months, but sometimes even decades, you know, they get extra time. 
and then they go and seek out the, the and it's hard because if you're an organ donor you sometimes don't want people to be able to trace you know your family but you, you hear about these stories where the recipient of an organ finds the family of the person whose organs were donated to them and they they go and they and they they lavish you know kind of uh, thanks and gifts and and they build a relationship with these people and it's very it can be terribly moving because you think about it it is a way for you to have your loved one live on in some way in someone else and there must be all kinds of questions that come up but i do think it's a fascinating subject oh are you willing to receive a heart Gareth? are you willing to because that's an, currently, inter- that's an interesting question. Yeah, like, are you willing to receive? You're not willing to give. We've established that. No, so but no, no lunch, which, no penis. Which, from which poor community in the world am I harvesting this <laughs> against <laughs> that person's will? Of course, I am. I'm willing to take a heart if I need a heart. Like, there's the black market, right, for everything, right? Yeah. So, like, apparently, like, especially on the dark web, in China. China. Yeah, like, Big There's game. also like dirty organs, right? So like, because mm-hmm. it's it's very hard to find a healthy heart. But like, if you're willing to take a heart with like hepatitis or HIV, uh-huh. like. There's like so many of those. Like, ah, dude, we'll just get some guy from Mexico. We'll pay him a grand. Cheapest chips. His family. For his heart. And, yeah, for his heart. Yeah, he he'll take care of his family and he gets to give away his heart. But he also has hepatitis. Are you willing to go like that far? Imagine to live, mm-hmm. like having an actual disease, but like you're still alive. You know, it's not even a question because I think we all underestimate the, 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 the survival instinct and the desire to live. And, and you can even see it in people who've been struggling with pain and, and, and having the most difficult time with, you know, chronic disease. And, and, and they still want to live, man. That desire to live is so strong. It's just unbelievable. So, all right, a couple of comments here quickly. Um, Sis Garrett says, Annette, that's awful. I am an organ uh, and blood marrow and tissue donor. Well, good for you, Annette. Then I'll be using your stuff. Um, and, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> unless you make a special clause that it, it's not for Garrett. I don't they mind. Can't do that. I don't think you can, actually. You can't there are too, choose. There are too many people. Don't donate, incinerate. More pandemics. <laughs> that's what Carl says. <laughs> wow. I meant, guys. Graft versus host disease. Every person who receives a transplant, bone marrow, stem cell transplant, this is their big fear. Your body rejecting what ultimately can help you. And that does happen. Mm, yeah, it does. it does. Yeah, like they give you like anti-rejection meds to like suppress your own immune system because like down to the T, your body can recognize if it's foreign. Mm. Yeah. That, that's, can, one of the, that's one of the genetic modifications that yeah. they did to this heart was remove um, some chromosomes that would make it so much more easy for the body to reject it. But also those anti-rejection drugs you have to take forever. Yeah, you have to take forever. And like, and you're like susceptible to sickness and whatnot because mm-hmm. it just suppresses your immune system. Like well, I think the only one that doesn't get anti-rejection is like a cornea implant because there's no blood there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Vyasin says, I want a horse's dick. Yeah, you see, this is going to start happening. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, it's called what? Xenotransplant. Why? transplantation what? right is it when you yeah. take the organs of an animal and you introduce them into a human xenotransplantation xeno meaning the same as it does in, in xenophobia foreign. from foreign. the outside foreign um you're gonna get people like i want a horse's dick you see Vyasin? that's where it all what? starts that's where it goes wrong what? well what? What, what, what do you what? think why come on what? What? come on <laughs> do we really have to dig this deep to run like a stallion <laughs> He says, nay, nay. This is, um, <laughs> this is all I have to say on this. This is probably such an old lady. She's like, mm-mm, mm-mm. she doesn't want to too talk much about info. It. Yeah. It's too much. It's too much. Too much. Well, while we're talking about that kind of thing, did you see that story about, um, and it's, it's just one person, but there's apparently a lot of this going on. I mean, as much as, you know, like three or four people is a lot. But um, apparently in, in the Ukraine at the moment, they don't care if you're transgender. If you were born a man on your birth certificate, you are fighting, girl. You know, even if you're in, if, even if you're in a, a, a mink stole and high heels, you are fighting. You know, I actually thought about this when, when the first trickling of news came out about giving guns to citizens, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the fact that they were letting the women and children leave 
but keeping the men behind. And yes. I was thinking, why is it not voluntary? Why are they not asking the women either? What if the women also want to fight? It's a bit of, why a, patri- they- bit of a patriarchal society, but... It's like this utter bullshit, right? Why are they not saying to everybody, we need fighters? Who wants to come up and fight? Because that's what you want. You want the people who yeah. want to fight. And, you know? and my guess is that you'd have a very low turnout of women anyway, but let them decide. Hmm. Yeah. Why like you lose nothing. Say... There's only ups, I guess. Yeah, like I think there's only ups. I just, uh, I would be, um, you certainly can't draft the women. That's never happened in history and it's not a good thing. Um, what are you talking about? They do well, it in Israel. In Israel, but in Israel, they, they draft any adult, but they give very specific. There's certain jobs that are just better handled by women, and certain jobs that are better handled by men. And obviously, that's a stereotype, and there are mm-hmm. exceptions to every rule. But they don't prove that the rule's stupid. Um, by and large, societies require men to do the fighting. By and large, that's been the history of the world. And of course, there are now places that are trying to turn that on their heads. And there will be women who want to volunteer to go and actually do the hand-to-hand combat, but there will be far fewer of those than than men. And of course, we should allow it, but it it shouldn't. I would hate to think of of my sister, my mother, any of the women in my life, frankly, being drafted. That would drive me uh, dilly. I'd want to move to a country where they wouldn't be. I'd rather be drafted than them. Although it sh- it really should still be a choice, and also yeah, my should, view is that war war requires many different skills, many different skills, not just fighting. Okay, and- but here's the problem: if if you leave it people to people to be volunteer fighters, you will get a huge core of people, like you know they did after the French Revolution, for example. Um, that was the first time that they mobilized the whole of society because the the army used to be a profession. And it used to also be a place for thieves and vagabonds and prisoners. And that's <laughs> really Absolutely. Because that's all they could do. And they were, they were skilled at using weapons. So That's you know, still who's in the, in the legionnaires, the French legionnaires. That's, those are still the type of people that they attracted to that particular infantry. And it was only during the French Revolution that conscription was in, introduced as an idea for the first time, right? Where the entire nation's men... Between the ages, any healthy man between, I think, the age of 16 at that point and 60 was, was drafted. Now, the reason they did that was because they realized that even though they got lots of volunteers, there weren't going to be enough people to, 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 to fight uh, against all the enemies of the French Republic at that point. So they had to issue conscription orders, and they did that to all men. So if you want equality, which it seems you see- that you're arguing for here— you can't make it voluntary because you're going to need to conscript people, in which case you have to conscript men and women, and that's where I'm out of the argument. There, there I don't believe in equality. I don't believe... You see, I think a 30-year-old woman can fight better than a 55-year-old man. But, like, if you throw out, like, I think what Gareth is trying to say is, if you throw out this volunteering thing, what if people don't volunteer? Hmm. So it's just easy to just make it, like, plain and simple. Like, women don't fight, take care right. of the babies, men go fight. And keep the economy. Let's, let's, let's take care of the babies. Keep the economy going. Look yeah. after the, the, the base because without all of that, what are we fighting for? Um, men throughout history have gone to war knowing that they're coming back for something. They don't mm-hmm. go to war with the uh, with their woman at their side, thinking, "Well, if we both get killed, that's it. Those kids will have to fend for themselves. <laughs> you know, then they'll just have to become. Uh, they'll have to sell their hair and teeth. Those children. But they would go to war because they knew the women would be going to." look after the house and the, and the children and the business if there was a business and you know keep the home fires burning otherwise what are you fighting for you, your motivation is sapped straight out of you if you know your wife is in the front line with you and that there's a high likelihood she'll be taken out just because women by and large again this is a generalization and they're going to be some feminists who are going to get upset with me but they're going to be killed quicker and faster than the men just because they're smaller and they're not necessarily as strong. Even, even a dumb, useless slob of a man has b- b- body proportion and body weight and, and, and muscular structure advantage over a woman. That's going to mean she's an easier target. She's someone easier to take down. And I don't want them fighting with me because then what am I going back for? Sorry. <laughs> Good 
there's some good arguments against uh, women going to fight. And I, I know people are bringing up Israel and everything. You know what that is. That's like a, that's a, um, a, a, a survival thing for Israel. The reason they did that is because they had, in the beginning, certainly, when, they, when the seven-day war broke out, there just was a tiny population. They didn't have enough people to fight. They had to do this. And also, it was do or die, because there wouldn't have been a, an Israel to go home to if they hadn't fought the women and the men. I get that. But maybe that's changing, too. Maybe that will eventually become a policy that isn't required, as it may have been in the beginning. Horrible... Horrible to have to be thinking about any of this in 2022. I mean, who thought we'd be having this How primitive? How I primitive? No. That, it really is, right? How primitive to be? <laughs> this is the conversation that we're having. <laughs> After so all cool. of that, on the one side, we're trying to find ways to go and live in Mars. Mm. Um, on the other side... We're trying side, to find immortality, human immortality. hearts, xenotransplants. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then... You have us in South Africa just trying to get to the office in the dark. <laughs> right. And, and then we've got bloody war. And and war and wars. I mean, it's. <sighs> well, let me, let me just go to Zach's comment and then we'll, we'll move on to something else because uh, he makes an interesting point. He says, I wish we still had compulsory military service for post matriculants for a year or two. We'd have better youth morale in general. Obviously, not under the ANC government, but everything under them goes to shit. Look. Zach, this but, is something, the last time we spoke about this was a kind of civil uh, yeah, service. Yeah, civil service. With Muzi Kuzwayo. This is what he suggested. It, and it doesn't have to be military. It can yeah. be, there, there's so many other things that people can do. Because one of the things that we, we really do, I think, need to teach young people is we need to teach them how to be citizens. Yes. We need to teach them yes. what it means to be a and citizen. You know, and I think South did. Korea does this. South Korea has like well, compulsory, I mean, like three so years. We already, two years. We already Nigeria do too. We we do this with medical students. You know, they, mm. they they have to do it as part of their training. And I know that many medical students have complained about it in the beginning, but later on they realize the experience they gained is invaluable. The kinds of places mm. that they're exposed to, the sort of people they're exposed to, the way that it teaches them about life. I think many of them look back on that. And please argue with me if you're a medical student. But many of them look back on that time of the Inquisasana Zuma years, as they called them. And they, they think of it with, with, I think, a great deal of pride. Because it's, it's kind of the crucible in which you start to experience the real world of medicine. If you're working in some faraway rural hospital and you are performing operations that you'd never get the chance to in a big city where there are professors all around you and surgeons who've got years and years of practice – it's triage in those places and you have to figure out a way of making it work. And I think that for the, the example for medicine could be transposed into many other areas of life. I mean, I think that, you know, the internships that so many people wish they had in business, that so many people wish they had in, in the military, perhaps um, in, in, in all these, we have so many needs in this country. We could have people sorting out, you know, roads and we could have people doing incredible things as part of their, you know, you donate a day a week, for example, to yeah, do this. Mandela day. But also you get to Mandela experience, you get to experience this beautiful country. You get to, right. like, leave your high walls in Santon and, and find yourself in Kumbu. Yeah. Or Limpopo. Mm. Imagine, you, you know, some kid in Limpopo oh, can, who's never seen Limpopo. the sea. <laughs> who's never seen the sea. You've never seen the ocean. And this is, you know, you get to experience this beautiful country so scientists have found and filmed one of the greatest ever undiscovered shipwrecks 107 years after it sunk uh, the endurance which is the lost vessel of ernest shackleton was found at the weekend at the bottom of the weddell sea the ship was crushed by sea ice and sank in 1915 forcing shackleton and his men to make an astonishing escape on foot and in small boats video of the remains show endurance to be in remarkable condition Although a friend of mine said, a ship that is not floating on the water is not in remarkable <laughs> condition. <laughs> Even though it has been sitting in three kilometers of water for over a century, it looks just like it did on the November day it went down. And they've released pictures of what it looks like. And, and they look amazing. Yeah, mm. it absolutely is. What do you think? I mean, this is really... Um, 
I, I, I'm always amazed when they discover because this is treasure, right? This is treasure. It's a different kind of treasure. It's not gold, but it's, a, it's treasure because these stories, again, of these explorers, these are some of the bravest people that ever lived. These guys went to conquer the most hostile climates on earth. These but were it's also like a testament adventure. and like, like, you know how the you old people like saying like, ah, oh, back in the day we used to Excuse do me. stuff proper. Uh, Excuse sorry. me, you sorry. old people. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. like but like back in the day you guys used to do stuff proper like if that architecture can remain like have you seen the yeah. stuff we build today like it crumbles the next day our roads for example That's, yeah i mean when they built a ship and they made it out of wood in those days you know yeah. and maybe a bit, like maybe was... a bit of steel because it was it was 1915 not 1615 but it's remarkable. And I'm, I'm just, I always find these stories absolutely fascinating. So I love it. They found Shackleton's ship and you can obviously find all the stories online. Um, it was trapped in sea ice for months before it sank in 1915. But there are some incredible pictures of, you know, the, 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 the original events that led to its sinking. And then they, they found this guy uh, who, you know, this guy who found the, the shipwreck. He's been looking for it for years. Dr. John Shears. He described the moment the cameras landed on the ship as jaw dropping. I was trying to find the name, but I, I know there's one of these tech millionaires, these like new age people, millionaires, whose mm. hobby is actually going out looking for shipwrecks and kind of diving for treasure. And that's just that's what he spends millions and millions on when it's his, yeah, like, like when I think he takes a week off and takes a, a a whole crew right. and a yacht out, and it's hectic. But also, I don't, I don't know when if you find the same it. Thing, says Pumi. But like Steven Spielberg has like a submarine, and he casually goes down looking for stuff and like like primitive fish and whatnot. He does. No, that, like, it's not. Yeah, it's Steven not Spielberg. Steven. Yeah. Even James Cameron does some of that. Oh yeah, James I mean, Cameron. Was, yeah. But oh yeah, this, that's why I meant James Cameron. I can't remember. I, I just can't remember. I've got like long COVID. It's COVID. Long COVID. <laughs> That's what's to blame for the, the memory lapse. All right. So here are some other stories that you might want to know about this morning. There, there was a car that disappeared into an enormous hole in the road after they made water repairs in the road. Now, this is not, uh, I mean, don't look surprised, Pumi. Uh, you've, seen some, you've seen some of the potholes in Johannesburg. You know what this is all about. So apparently <laughs> it happened in, in, let me see. They, they had a blue Toyota Taz. It happened on Tuesday night. Um, a Gauteng MEC for Public Transport and Roads, Jacob Mamabolo, wished the injured motorist a speedy recovery and added that the big hole was left open by City of Joburg staff. Let me confirm that the road we're referring to, the City of Joburg, according to reports we received last night, had been working on that road, fixing a water leakage. They didn't close the hole for a very long time, exposing road users to accidents. How um, big is the hole? Show it's you a picture. Car sized. It's you car sized. All right. So I don't have any details on where exactly it was, but have a look at this. First of all, there's this terrible picture, but you can see the opening of the hole. Um, and here's a better picture of it. That's a big ass hole. They pulled that blue Taz out of that hole. There are pipes there. That, I mean, that's a big, you could fit a whole car and maybe a half in there. But that's that's the point, right? A hole that big. How are you? How fast are you going as a driver that you don't see it coming? Oh, Pumi, come on! Ah, this is Pumi. There should have been signs though, and like barricades, and also it should have been closed up. Yeah, so the motorist look, was injured. All of that, all of that is <laughs> all of that notwithstanding, it should have been taped up. It should have had cones. It should right. But it's a bloody big hole. How do you not see it coming? As a driver, as you are driving along the road. Maybe it was raining really hard. It was. Hole. It was raining hard on um, yesterday morning. I went in for a, for a meeting at nine o'clock and I was on the highway and it took me an hour and a half. And there was, there was a lot of rain. And I, if I were driving along even slowly, I wouldn't see that hole. If it was just left open like that, I hope this guy <laughs> sues. I hope he sues the city. I don't know if he's going to get anything, but I hope he sues them. There's nothing to possible. get. Oh, well, exactly. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that whole story. 
maybe this is something we save for the burning platform, but uh, the magistrate, Betty Kumalo, delivered her judgment saying that the state had successfully proven beyond reasonable doubt that the former minister, Batabile Dlamini, had lied under oath during the proceedings of the inquiry into the Sasa Grants debacle. <laughs> so there we go. Now, it's not just um, someone's opinion. But Tabile Dlamini, it turns out, is probably one of the worst people we've ever had in government. Are you surprised? <laughs> Does it surprise anybody? What? She had to appear, there. She had to appear in, the, in, in the court. There's this pathetic picture of it. Do you want to see what it looked like when she actually appeared in front of the magistrate? Look at this. Oh, I thought you were going to show us the picture of her sitting behind... Um... Carl Diaz in oh, his no. like in his no. in his ANC he's, tie. What is he he's become like the cheerleader for every ANC person who goes to court, right? That's what he is now. That's his full time job. His day there. He spends what his a, day there. What a, what a human being. I just want to point out when we're looking at this picture of Batabili Dlamini, and for those who are listening instead of who are looking, um, she's wearing a red jacket with those buttons are taking more strain than the endurance did in that ice. <laughs> Shackleton in 1915, going across her rather enormous front, and it's not it's not a weight thing; it's a boob size thing. My God, Butterbee Lidlamini could fit four it's of her heads in each boob. It's not a boob size <laughs> thing; it's a it's the wrong bra. This this is men don't know. About I don't think they this. make bras that big, Pumi. They Come do. On. They do. That is Dolly, that is. Dolly Parton is looking at that now, going, "Oh hell no." <laughs> <laughs> and look at her and look at Dolly Parton. It's always got the right kind of bra. Those tits no. are always facing up. Always. No. I can't say the same for poor old Batabi <laughs> Litlamini. And I only say poor old because I always I always feel a little bit sad for anyone who's a granny or grandpa's age who ends up in trouble with the law. I even said this about Jacob Zuma when it happened. So don't don't call me a, a hypocrite. At least I'm consistent. Anyway, she is going to now have to um to take this up. She pleaded not guilty, of course, to the charge, denied giving false information. Um, the inquiry found that she'd concealed the extent of her involvement in the debacle. Of course she did. Politician, right? It is this court's view, the magistrate said, that the defense is merely grasping at straws and playing with semantics. It is therefore this court's view that the argument has no merit because all the evidence points to the minister having at least two to three meetings with the work streams, which would mean meetings um, where she made the decisions. I'm therefore satisfied that the state has beyond reasonable doubt proved a case against the accused on the main count. The accused is accordingly found guilty of the charge in respect of the main charge of perjury, which can carry a jail sentence. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens. Yeah, the NPA is apparently asking for five years. Wow. I feel like she's going to be out of medical parole or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, politicians yeah. never go to jail for long. Yeah. Do they? Especially, yeah, uh, we know we've got this thing about accountability, <laughs> right? The Germans, uh, trust the Germans, your people, Pumi, they've made a bicycle without wheels. Can you believe that? German engineering. A bicycle I without was... wheels. So surely it shouldn't be called a bicycle? Uh, well, Stefan Henrich is a German architect. He's embraced the uh, field of motion as his area of interest, based in Stuttgart. He lectures at some of the city's most prestigious institutions. And although trained in architecture, he's built a global reputation as one of the most insightful practitioners of something called additive design. So thanks to 3D printers, accessible software, and that kind of thing, it might be fun to print your own coat hanger or shelving brackets, but the true potential is in creating something called integrated production nodes, reducing the burden of outsourcing. So he's made one really big tire and, Try to imagine this. Again, I'm going to put up a picture, but if you're, if you're listening instead of watching, it's almost like the figure of eight between yeah, the, the two wheels. Sign. Correct, yeah. the infinity sign. But it, it doesn't really, the two pieces don't cross over. It's almost like a conveyor belt that goes under the seat and then comes out in two wheels on the side. So it looks a bit like this. Um, it's incredible. And that is what this guy designed. So it has one big wheel that is in almost the figure of eight which is incredible because I, I, I mean, I, it's really is a mind-bending thing. I'd like to see it in motion mm. to be able to understand it completely. 
But, you know, trust the Germans. Again, Pums, we may have ESCOM and war and some things that are pulling us backwards. But somewhere in the world, there are people transplanting pig hearts and developing bicycles without wheels. Amazing. Amazing, amazing stuff. We really are living oh, in right, Gareth, Speaking about ESCOM, you know, I don't experience load shedding. Why? What's your, which, Why? which government I, minister I, I do you have? I don't know. Like, so, like, I stay in Boxburg. So, like, Everly, it's close to East Run Mall. Like, there's mm. no load shedding. There's not even a load shedding schedule in that side. Mm. Like, I have, like, when they said level four, so I was like, oh, okay, surely, maybe. Nothing. Who lives in your neighborhood? I don't know. Someone important, clearly. I, well, I this is the first advert I've ever heard for Boxburg, where people are going, hmm, maybe, hey? <laughs> Maybe. Are, are you near a hospital, Britt? Are you near a hospital or something? Well, there's the airport. Like, I narrowed it down. There's the airport. There's, okay, UK East Rand Mall. It's just a mall. But, like, yeah, like, there's the airport roundabout Nobody there. Maybe on the East same Rand. grid as the airport. The East Rand Mall has <laughs> closed. So that's going to hit. That's not going to hit anybody really hard. Um, but the, the, the airport, that's probably why, hey? Yeah, that's maybe probably that's why. Because maybe, maybe it's because of the airport. Maybe on the same grid as the airport. Because I'm not that close. But like, uh, like it, maybe it's on mm. the same grid as the airport. Could be. But like, zero load shedding. Never. <laughs> well, <laughs> guys, as, as, as a payback for zero load shedding, you have to listen to planes landing at all times of the day. Oh, yeah. Yo, yo, guys, yo, that, that took an adjustment. Yo, yo, that took an adjustment. Is it just you like, live, <laughs> you live under the flight path? No, like you kind of see them like from afar. They're not under the flight path, but like you see them pretty close. Oh, yo, yo, I often it's, wonder it's when, really when you come into land at Oar Tambo, I, I think about those houses that are right underneath you because the planes are quite low at that point. They must make mm -hmm. a hell of a noise. It must be really, really terrible. I, it really is. It really is. My uncle used to stay at a place like that was under the flight path. Like he <laughs> knew by schedule. Oh, okay. Now, now this plane is landing. Oh, no, no. This one is landing now. Hey, you know who still lives in that area? M Mash says uh, Gwede lives there. Boxburg. Oh, thanks, Gwede. Gwede. Oh. I think it's just a way for the, for the South African people to, to, to pay back the people of Boxburg for living under the flight path. I think this is our way of like, you know what, guys? You've had a tough enough life. Here's some free electricity while the rest of us are suffering. Well, not free, but you can carry on getting some. Yeah. So we we had load shedding yesterday, obviously, like everybody else. But we also live in an area with a substation that is very old and has and and even as they are trying to kind of maintain it and upgrade it, our substation is. A, so when the power came back yesterday, yeah. guess what? Blew up. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. A blown distributor. Blown distributor. We still have no power. You know. We I, still have no power. So this morning, I mean, it rained the whole day yesterday. So even my little solar backup ran yeah. out of juice. This morning, still no power. When I left the house this morning at like 20 past five. Can you imagine all the damage that's being done to things like fridges and computers yeah. and your, your household equipment that you've paid for that um you know the the, the kinds of and and then you think that's about insured this, that's insured, it's insured but your insurance won't pay out no they won't mm -hmm. and you think about the uh, something big like a substation and how, what kind of strain it puts on the electricity grid when you switch on and switch off the whole time because of course load shedding is like a you know it's like a last ditch attempt to save the, the network but yeah. you damage all the equipment on the way in and out whenever you switch that power mm. on and off. So like we, I always picture it as like Gareth, like you know how you when you're a kid, like your mom is like fighting with you, no, don't play with the lights, you're gonna you're gonna blow off mm. the lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like imagine they no, they're doing that on a national scale, like they're just switching stuff on and off. Mm -hmm. That that can't be good for anything, let alone nope. old substations that aren't maintained because ESCOM is a terrible company. <sighs> Well, let's see what we, we're going to reap uh, the, the, the marvelous rewards of this over the next couple of years. So even if they, they manage to provide us with el enough electricity, they, I don't think they, they're maintaining all these different places and substations yeah. and things as well as they could. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a whole second wave of bullshit, even if we survive this first wave. And I, I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about ESCOM. <laughs> all well, right. There is a fifth wave coming. Of we're not in the, we're, we're like, in, is it fifth wave? I was about I to think, say, maybe we're like in a sixth Again. Wave. 
didn't we provide the world with the solution to this pandemic? Everybody's giving Vladimir Putin credit for ending COVID because obviously no one's talking about COVID anymore with Russia and Ukraine going on. But we deserve that credit because we invented Omicron and that has saved everybody. So can we, can we get some credit for a change instead of just getting the blame for all the bad things? I would like us to get... I, I'm going to appeal to the Nobel Prize Committee and say that the people of South Omni Africa... Omnicron of South saves Africa, lives. Yes. The people of South Africa deserve the Nobel Prize for Medicine for our fortitude in ignoring our government and getting herd immunity before anyone else in the world and then doing everyone in the, in the world a favor of Give spreading it around immunity. as well to help them. Yes. So if you're alive today, after all they said about COVID and everything else, uh, you're alive today. It's thanks to the people of South Africa. Give us that goddamn prize from no Nobel, <laughs> Alfred Nobel. Give it to us now. We deserve it. All right. I can't believe it, but it's already almost seven o'clock. This hour has just flown by. We had lots that we still wanted to talk about. Let me quickly tell you about mental health because that is everybody's favorite topic in the world at the moment. Our mental health is being tested in these strange and difficult times. No kidding, right? Whether it's ESCOM, COVID, war in the world, pig heart transplants, all the stuff we covered this morning. But the fact is, life is very challenging for many of us at the moment. In the latest episode of Health Matters, Ryan O'Connor is joined by clinical psychologist Jeannie Cave. And uh, she guides us through managing our mental health during a volatile and uncertain time. Health Matters is, of course, available on wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever app you use. It's brought to you by Sipla, and you can find it on all good podcasting networks. That is called Health Matters. Look it up with our friend Ryan O'Connor and his special guest, uh, Jeannie Cave. And you can find out all about the mental health aspects of people going through tough times. You might even recognize yourself in that story. Coming up, the burning platform where we will check in on all the big stories in the world and we'll be joined by someone we haven't seen for a little while but we love talking to. That is Sonny Moeng. We've got plenty to discuss with him. If you've got anything you want brought up on the burning platform, let us know, right, Pumi? We are happy to hear from you. Absolutely. You know, we, can't, we can't be expected to come up with all the stuff that the news doesn't just hand to us on a daily basis. Maybe there's some story you really want to hear about. So let us know. There we go. Contact central.com. All right, Bakabantu, thank you very much, dude. And uh, Pumi, we'll, we'll check in with you. Hey, Bakabantu, if you want to hang around for the burning platform, you're welcome to. Uh, yo, I, I'll hang around on the listening side, Gareth. <laughs> the blame wow. platform gets hectic sometimes. Yo, did you see this Pumi Crusher guy? I watched a live crushing. <laughs> By the way, I mean, I'm going to start the next hour by just discussing the, the argument that you and that, uh, what, that dude from Cape Independence? Cape Town, Cape Independence. Your, the two of you had a full go on Twitter after the show, and I loved it, but I stayed the hell out of it. Felt very <laughs> lucky. I, I was there like a popcorn, like I'm like huh. this could be just like boom, brutalized. Ooh, <laughs> that, <laughs> Sometimes the exciting stuff happens after the show. Who knew? <laughs> Even on the show, she was like, she was ready. She was like, I want numbers. And the guy was like, oh, like no. rhetoric. And then this be, the first comment of Shade was like, So you're not from here, you're from Britain. No, 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 no. It, it may have, it, no, 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 no. It, it was just establishing the facts. It's important to establish the facts. You can't just, you can't just be out here. You, no, it's important to establish the facts. It's baseline, you know, so that we all understand. We all move from the same platform. That's all I was doing. I was just fi figuring out what's going on. It's like, what, what's with the accent? What's with the accent? I'm like, yeah, it's gonna be a bad day, my guy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll save. Got to save some. Keep the powder dry for the next hour. Let's not use up all of our strength now because there's uh, so much fire in Pumi. She'll she'll start guns blazing. But we do have an exciting show for you planned in the next hour. Stick around, and we will catch up in a couple of seconds. <laughs> This week on the Auto Trader Podcast. The rising number of car accident claims are being rejected on the basis of reasonable precautions. Reasonable precautions requires that the insured must use all reasonable care and take reasonable precautions to prevent or minimize loss, damage, death, injury, or liability.
yeah. breach of the clause by the insured may warrant the rejection of the claim. I mean, what do you think? Catch us every Monday at 9 a.m. on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za. suffer from collectivism, collectivity, collectionitis? Do you have an obsession with objects? Are you a fanatic, a devotee, an aficionado? Cliff Central dispenses a weekly dose of collectomania. Join me as I talk to compulsive collectors. Fascinating, intriguing, possibly a little weird. Collectomania, Mondays on The Gareth Cliff Show, brought to you by SA Gold Coin Exchange and The Scoin Shop. Yes, indeed. It is time for the burning platform. This is uh, our favorite part of the week where we get to dissect and analyze and look into and sometimes just comment like outrageously on things that are going on in the news. And there's always so much to talk about. So this week will be no different. Sometimes the burning platform leads itself onto other platforms after the show where people continue to argue and fight, as Pumi will have demonstrated ably last week. Hey, Pums, I'm not criticizing. I loved it. I just didn't. Listen it. here. It, it, you know what was fascinating for me is how on the show, yeah. in the moment, we just weren't getting answers, right? And then two hours after the show, <laughs> keyboard warriors, mm. now, you, now you suddenly like, have everything at your fingertips. And and that's that's all it is for me. So I it think became, that's... It became a very um, detailed argument about how exactly police authority is devolved between the national police and the provincial police and who's actually in charge and who's responsible for dealing with, with things on different levels. It comes down to like constitutional stuff. And I saw the two of you arguing and I just thought, well... There are maybe 20 people in the country who actually even understand this argument, and I, I wasn't one of them, so I stayed out. It is anyway time for us to start uh, anew this morning with all the things that have been going on in the last week and so much more. And we are joined by Solly Moeng, of course, well known to our listeners and to our viewers. Solly, the founder of Don Valley Reputation Managers, as well as a freelance writer and columnist and someone who's never been afraid to say what he thinks. Solly, it's nice to see you, my friend. How are you? Hang on, I, I muted you. talk you. about crushing people before you get uh, you, you let the guest in. I, I know. I'm sorry no, about that. I did, did it intimidate you at all? Because you're not the kind of person who gets no, intimidated. No, no. It, doesn't, it doesn't get intimidated. It excites me. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. So, first of all, Sully, um, we've, we've got a lot of things on the agenda, but give us a quick update as to, uh, to what you've been busy with because I've, I've read – I get your newsletter. 
Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Do. Yeah, I, I keep watching South Africa. You know, I keep thinking that one day we'll do something different, better to become, to say to the world, aha, uh -huh, you thought you wouldn't make it, but, you know, people keep disappointing me. The ANC keeps disappointing me. It's like, I always, I also try to talk about good stories, you know, Gareth and Gumi, mm. because people say, yeah, you tend to be, to be focused on negative things, but you know, I love South Africa, and I think that if we be, if we pretend that these bad things are not happening, we're going to live in cuckoo land, and I don't want to be in cuckoo land, then we're going to end up supporting schmucks, you know, in politics, Absolutely. like many do. No, no, that's why I like your newsletters. I, I like a healthy dose of, of realism, but I do, I do think I'm an optimist as well, and I think all three of us are actually. Yes. Uh, having read plenty of your stuff, having, having been with Pumi on this show for years, and having known her for years before that too, I think we're all optimists, but we're also realistic. Like there are some things that the South African people are very resilient, and we've come through all kinds of stuff, and we'll make yeah. it through all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah. our, our leaders, leaders in inverted commas, have been. Deeply, deeply disappointing, and I don't think either of you will disagree about that. Oh, what South Africa needs is hot love. Mm. Yeah, I, I bumped into someone yesterday, um, and 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 he's a young black professional who said to me, "Do you really think that uh, that there are a crop of leaders that we can rely on going forward?" And I thought it was such an interesting question. I said to him, "Look, you're asking the wrong guy because I I wouldn't know the first way to uh, the the, the I wouldn't know where to start answering that question. Right. He was asking me about people inside the ANC, Julius Malema, opposition politicians. And he said, are any of these people the right people to lead us? And I looked at him and I said to him, I don't know, but I actually think you might be better than any of them. Having known him for all of five minutes because he sounded like he was more sensible than any of them. Right, right. Yeah, we need to, to to start looking for some of the answers within ourselves. I think we've given too much power to politicians. We've treated them like heroes and heroines over over almost 30 years now. They, we've mm. normalized the abnormal in South Africa. It's bad. Mm. So, guys, can we jump out of the frying pan into the fire and just get to something which is among the talking points you wanted to raise, Solly, but to me it's something which just keeps raising its ugly head for me, we've discussed it once or twice before, especially in relation to politicians who seem to be stoking these fires. Um, xenophobia. And we see again this week in Alex um, that there are, there are people, they call themselves Operation Dudula, and these guys are going around. And they're right. basically threatening and intimidating foreign nationals. People who, frankly, whether they are here legally or illegally, they are now part of or should be part of the community. They're providing a service to that community. They're selling goods. They're trying to make a living, trying to support their family. Some of these people come from the most terrible war-torn places. And they are the first to be victimized when the economy is slow, when there aren't enough jobs, when people are dissatisfied with the state of their own communities. There's no service delivery. They take it out on these guys. And I don't think I'm going to have much of an argument from you two about this. Clearly, that's wrong. But in the long term, are we dealing with this? And do we have a way to deal with this? Or is it just going to become worse and worse for foreign nationals until the point that outright xenophobic attacks start happening and we have people murdered in our streets? Is that where it's going to go? Look, the ANC opened the floodgates long ago, and it's going to be really hard. I, I totally agree with you. There are many people who came here from other parts of the world, especially Africa, or including Africa, who've been here for years, for 15, 20 years. They've had mm. kids here, and South Africa is home. Their kids only know South Africa is home. Mm -hmm. home. You can't just chase them away. But what, what we do need... We do need to normalize uh, population registration. I mean, it's crazy to say people can just walk into South Africa and we don't know who they are, what they're running away from, because not everybody ran away because uh, the, 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 the situation is bad back home. Some of them could be fugitives from, for, for criminal offenses they committed elsewhere. Mm. So it's important that when people arrive in a country, they are, they, are, they, are, they are registered. They come through the normal channels. They don't pay the officials at the border in order to come in or officials at home affairs to get an ID. I'm not opposed to people being in South Africa. I'm in a foreign country right now. But where I am, I had to go to the, an office to announce myself to this. This is who I am. I'm here. This is what I do for a living. And they know that I'm here. But in Johannesburg, you don't know who is there. But it's not right to attack people. It's not right to to go after foreigners in the script. 
and discriminately because as you say many of them create jobs in South Africa many of them are good in, doing yeah. awesome things in South Africa but it, it you see the things it's not a black and white thing the, 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 by saying don't attack foreigners and you shouldn't attack foreigners we're not saying don't control foreigners or anybody mm -hmm. including us we are controlled so the South African authorities know who I am there's a birth yeah. uh, registration from why can't they be the same thing for foreigners coming to South Africa irrespective of where they come from yeah Pumi, I mean, this is something you've brought up before, and, and we've spoken about how politicians like Herman Mashaba and Julius Malema have been stirring this pot for their own political purposes. And you see, what, what we're also seeing is we're seeing a level of populism kind of growing on, on the ground, as it were. So the, the guys who started this thing, they call it Operation Tudula, and sad to say it started in my township. Um, and, and that particular boy um, who's, who, who is the big mouthpiece for it is also the guy, I think you, you would remember when the, the July riots happened, he was one of the people who kind of formed a guard around Maponyamon. Mm, yeah. So that boy is the person who, who who's now emerged as kind of the, the main voice mouthpiece for this operation to do now, which is what they're calling it in Soweto. And he, interestingly and strangely enough, when what happened in Alex, and in Alex they're calling it something Operation Fiela or something, um, the first thing he did was he came out to say, those people are not part of us. We don't know what those people are up to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But more than anything, what you what it shows is a, a complete collapse and failure of state policing, because this is criminal, right? If you decide, Gareth, that you don't like a particular person or you don't like a particular business, you do not have the right to walk into that business, destroy that business, or hit and scream and shout at the people or you don't have that right or, or, or even walk in like julius malema did and yeah. start asking Absolutely. which ones are from south africa and which ones are from zimbabwe but you know guys you both have indicated something which makes it very difficult for us to be principled about this and sully i appreciate that you're saying you know be a legal immigrant but the fact is we don't make it very easy for people to comply with the law it's almost easier in south africa for you to not comply with the law because so much of the state apparatus, including policing, is destroyed. It's useless. It's defunct. It doesn't, it doesn't do what it's meant to do. And this is government's fault. So while we are well within our rights to blame illegal immigrants for not having gone through the due processes that you yourself Absolutely. have to go through for being in the country you're in right now, Sonny, mm -hmm. and, and Pumi and I are law-abiding citizens, and we fill in our forms, and we get our licenses, and we do all the things that we're meant to do, it seems you almost are punished for going with the law, and yeah. you are excused for breaking it. And this is government's fault. So let's start with them. If they, if they don't have the systems to make these things work or the police to be able to stop people from breaking the law, then it's all a fiction anyway. Yeah. Look, Gareth, I started by saying the ANC opened the floodgate gates mm. long ago. And something I always repeat, that I've been holding myself not to say now, is that the solutions that South Africa needs in order to become the country it must be will not be found while the ANC governs or, or, or lords it over the affairs of South Africa. That's the problem. Because the, the changes that are needed are systemic changes over time. It's not just getting Pumi or Gareth to become president, the next president. And it will not take the mandate of one political power or party, whatever formation it's going to be, that takes over from the ANC. It's going to take two, three, four mandates to systemically. Because they've over the years, the ANC has inserted people throughout the systems in yeah. South Africa. And they've also allowed people to think that the world owes them something. And that's the problem. So, so yeah. people can just do whatever they want. If the people at the top don't respect the law also, the people at the, at the bottom don't, don't see why they should respect the law. So under the ANC, the ANC has lost the moral high ground long ago. It's going to be time for anybody coming in with the mantle of the ANC to say to South Africa, okay, now this is how it's going to run. It's too late. Yeah, I mean, here's... You know, Patrick's also added this in because we mentioned the obvious suspects. But don't forget that clown Gaten McKenzie and the PA for checking for expired foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are lots of people who are spreading. It's always it's this happens in countries all over the world. South Africa is not unique here, but xenophobia seems to be 
or any kind of scapegoating seems to be the last resort, the last resort of a population who are so desperate and have lost such hope that they start to turn on the weakest and most vulnerable among us. Yeah. That's but always that, what happens. So, you know, Gareth, the other thing is, you know, I, I always talk in terms of brands. South Africa is a country, is, is a country, the destination brand. All brands are led, okay? The person at the top of the brand must be very clear. They must lead by tone. They must lead by example. They must be clear about what, what the country stands for. South Africa does not have a president who is unambiguous on a lot of things, and that is a problem. So he doesn't. He's, he, he likes to like, okay, say something, and, and, and he's, it's almost like he's looking over his shoulder to make sure that in case they throw the, a tomato on him on this side, he'll, he'll, he has another side to fall on. Well, he has to be I clear mean, about this. Thing. Case, in case in point is, is the way that we've responded to the Russia Ukraine situation. We, we, we seem exactly. to be trying to walk a tightrope between both of them, trying to look like good people to both sides, yeah. where it is clear that there are many people in our government, including Minister Fia Fokol. Uh, who's currently touring, uh, telling us that he's landed in Russia and he's landed in Ukraine, which, I mean, haven't those people suffered enough that they now have to put up with Fikil in Balula as well? But you see that in the, in the foreign policy, when, you know, Naledi Pandor has to withdraw her statements about being against Russian aggression in Ukraine, which seems right. to me to be a universal uh, point of view uh, where, where, you know, Vladimir Putin is, is seen across the the board, the board is being the, the aggressor. Uh, no, suddenly she has to retract her statement because the ANC inside no longer has the, the machinery to be able to make cogent, pointed policy or, or position statements. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we don't know what the ANC owes to whom. That's a problem. The minute you become indebted to somebody, they start owning you, right? <laughs> so you, you can't right. say the things that you need to say because the backbone is gone. There's no backbone inside. Look, we can stay, spend the whole hour talking about the many instances when the ANC lost it, okay, when it could have stood firm and said, this is what we stand for in South Africa. But it didn't because because it has to keep looking over its shoulder, looking, looking into its pocket. Who, who's giving it money? giving it money. From the time it refused a visa to the Dalai Lama, things yeah. began to derail. Yeah. Pums? You know, the, the you Chinese... Know. Oh, sorry. The Chinese tried to say to stop Mandela from receiving the Dalai Lama in South Africa. He said, no, go to hell. I remember okay? that. And, and remember the US, yeah. the US tried to stop him from inviting his friends, Muammar Gaddafi yeah. and, uh, and Yasser exactly. Arafat, and he said, go to hell. And it we still had the hell. ability to do that once, and exactly. then it all just went away. And I remember, you remember Archbishop Desmond Tutu saying, this is my friend, I expect yeah. that my government will allow him to come yeah. and visit. Yeah. By then, we were already receiving marching orders from yeah. China. But do you also, one more thing, do you remember when the South Africa abstained from a United Nations vote to protect the rights of LGBTIQ plus communities? Mm -hmm. Yep. Following that vote, the media was like, wait, wait, wait a minute. We protecting these rights are enshrined in our constitution in South Africa. What the hell? Why did you guys abstain? The minister, the, the lady with the hole in her head at the time, she was minister of foreign affairs or whatever they call it these days. She said, we South Africans cannot afford to be seen walking too far ahead of our African peers. The African peers who murder and jailed gays and lesbians, we, we should have stood up and said, guys, this is how it runs, okay? These, when we defended al-Bashir in South Africa, same thing, too many instances. So we don't, the world doesn't know what we stand for. We stand for crooks. We stand with crooks. Okay, actually, we, led by the ANC, misled by the ANC, stand with crooks. You Putin know, is a murderer. And, and one of the things, and I know, Soli, you wanted to talk about this as well, is it then leads to, and it, it almost feels like Everything that's happening in the ANC sucks the rest of the country into it, right? And, and we spoke with Leto when he was on the show after uh, President Tabomeki was in the Free State talking about how the ANC, uh, it, it's a, the failure of the ANC does not bode well for South Africa. And I call bullshit, right? I think even as we're watching them going into the their elective conference mm. later this year mm. is the, the ANC is no longer a dying organization. It is actually a dead and decaying organization. And I think that it is it would behove well for all South Africans yes. to look inside themselves for mm. what what the answer is yes. and look for a a, a post ANC 
post-liberation South Africa and what roles we have to play in it. What, what, is, what does that world look like? The sooner South Africans come to the realization and the reality that this is where we are headed yeah. and, and stop looking to, to the past and stop mm. looking back towards an, an ANC that was moral, an ANC that had a moral high ground. Mm. And that is, for me, a conversation for a whole other day of whether the ANC actually ever had that or the ANC that we we have in our heads is, right. is some kind of fantasy ANC that that was never a reality. It was the organization was never what we wanted to be. It was never Nelson Mandela. He was not the ANC. Nor was the ANC. Nor does the ANC have the DNA of a Nelson Mandela. So, yeah, it's it's painful. You know what? I describe the ANC as an old power station that has re reached the, at the point where it must be decommissioned. End of, done life. It, <laughs> end of life. This is where it needs to be decommissioned. All right? There's no way that the ANC is going to give South Africa solutions. And the thing is, in if, whether you are in a personal relationship, in whatever kind of relationships, we are in a relationship with, with the ANC, we have to determine our own value as South Africans until we stand up and say, no, this is what we want to stand for the ANC will keep telling us what we st we stand for. So whenever it makes crazy decisions, it gives money to Cuba, Even it doesn't even ask us whether we should be giving money to Cuba, how much, all these things that are happening. The ANC thinks it, it's doing it in the, on the, in the name of South African people. And it's not because it doesn't represent us anymore. It represents itself. And South Africans need to say, no, okay, now, wait a minute. We don't want this anymore. This is who we are. We need to unite. As long as we remain... Uh, disunited. Is, can you say disunited mm -hmm. <laughs> in English? Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, or whether it's on racial, political uh, uh, platforms, the ANC will play with those divisions. We need to, of course, we'll always be divided. There's no country where people are homogenous in their thinking and their perspectives of life. That's okay. But we as South Africans need to say, this is South Africa we want, that we signed up for, that we want to make, uh, to, to, whose potential we want to see realized. But it cannot happen while we keep thinking that the ANC will lead us to that South Africa, because it won't. And it's taken us a, a while and it's cost us a lot to get to the point where we've realized that we have an abusive parent in the ANC. Yeah. So that it's almost like if, you know, if anyone found a, a time capsule in the future of this show and they listen to this, they'd go, wow, the, you know, why, why did it take them so long to, yeah. to realize that, that they were being mistreated and mishandled and abused like this, the people of South Africa? But the fact is I saw a I saw a couple of news stories, and credit to ENCA for this, because I don't watch the news often, but I saw they went to about four municipalities mm -hmm. over the course of one news bulletin, two in, in the northwest, um, one in the Western Cape, one in Gauteng, I think, and they showed sewerage going down the streets, you know, all the things that we're used to seeing, but they, right. they focused on the... Of course, none of the people who are actually in charge of those municipalities would make themselves available to answer a single question. <laughs> Uh, all the municipalities in question were also bankrupt or in huge financial distress because money has been stolen. And I thought, you know what? These are the people, those people who live in those, in those places and all of us who didn't have electricity last night, for example, yeah. and all the rest, we are yeah. paying the price for putting our trust in the wrong people. And, and I, I don't want us to carry on about this for too long, but it does seem that we need a psychological come down from – like anyone who's been in abusive relationships, yes. Yes. you need to be you need to be counseled out of it, and we have to now do that to ourselves because no one's going to counsel us. Mm. We've got to figure it out ourselves. Yeah. Let's look at some practical things. Um, and this seems like a dead horse, but we've got to keep beating it until it eventually either gets up or we can get the death certificate. The NPA. What's happening with the NPA? I mean, does anyone have any answers? Sally, you watch this. These days, when I when I listen to Pato, he speak, but he speak in public. It's almost like she's one of the ANC cadres who've been deployed there. She of speaks like she, a, is. she she's making excuses after excuses after. Excuses. There's so much information that has been put out there by investigative journalists. By you now, even there was on the commission. She always mm. find a way to say, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough. But what is good enough? What has she done? She hasn't done anything. I mean, this lady, I don't. Is, is she only fine for ten year term? She needs oh, to go. Now. But, the, but the thing is, even us, if she goes, us. but the, the, the pen thing, and like I said, Ed, we won't find the solutions around the ANC. But once she goes, they're going to find somebody else who looks like her. Hopefully, it'll be a Tulima Doncella style person who will turn around and say, wait a minute, that's not right. But so far, we are not lucky. 
No. <laughs> Sully, you are a person that, that works with reputations and building reputations and rebuilding reputations. In your view, in your professional um, op opinion, the NPA today, what does it need to do to, to fix its reputation and be able to, to kind of emerge from, and we know, we know what happened at the NPA. We know what over the past, and, and look, we're not going to be able to, to look back and say in 24 months, this is, <laughs> this is, this is what you can do to undo 10 right. years, right. 10 years of, of kind of systemic breaking down of an organization. Mm. But having worked with rebuilding the reputation of people and organizations, what is it that you believe the NPA should be doing today to start that turnaround? Look, the people of South Africa generally are looking for justice. There was state capture on all other forms of abuses and corruption have taken place. People want to see those who've been named implicated at least being uh, prosecuted, whether they get you know, they are innocent or, or not after this different matter. They want to see people in the court. The job, the mandate of the NPA is to prepare dockets to charge people to put them in front of our court system. And it's not doing that. Until it gets begins to do that, to deliver on the basics of its mandate, it will not have a reputation revival. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the reputation management thing, <laughs> sometimes even the, even the greatest spin doctors, I mean, didn't Bell Pottinger try to help them rehabilitate their personality or at least distract us long enough? That they could they could be stealing. I know you they're know, not in the business you're in. I know. You, you had me. You had me so much, guys. Yeah, you know, they're evil spin doctors, and we know that they've had to they've had to shut down their their, their business. But um, this this war in Ukraine and Russia is it seems to be all over the news all the time. Obviously, the the news agencies are thrilled because it might actually get them some viewers and some readers and some listeners again. But it seems to me that. This is something that actually affects South Africa at a great distance. I right. mean, Muzi Kuzwayo wrote a, an interesting thing about how the Ukraine and Russia thing could change everything, especially for Africa, which I thought was an interesting insight. Perhaps you guys share that point of view. But I also saw Yuval Noah Harari talking about it, saying mm -hmm. this is actually a bit of a critical juncture for the world because what it really is is authoritarianism, war, going back in time, versus yeah. saving liberal democracy and all the things that we now take for granted in Correct. society. Uh, what do you think that is? What do you think the significance of Russia-Ukraine is? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I mean, for me, it started with Donald Trump's kind of, I know you kind of like him. <laughs> but when mm. you have the kind of leaders who think it's all about themselves and not about the people, and you have all these schmucks running amok in Africa as presidents yeah. and primaries and all they look at those things those bad things happening in russia and places like this and say, uh-huh if they can do it why can't we do it here so it mm -hmm. justifies wrong in africa that's the part that, that that scares me the most there's no moral high ground anymore in the world in terms of leadership or well, there's very little we have to like look at and not not too famous presidents and prime ministers out there but the fact is right. when when we run out of people to look up to to say those are the those are the, that's the kind of leadership we should be emulating and when all of that goes away, the schmucks in Africa think, aha, uh -huh, you see, you think that you, you keep judging us, we keep telling us we are wrong. Look, it's happening in America, it's happening in Russia, it's happening anywhere. But people forget that Putin, forget Ukraine, that man kills people who disagrees with him. He gets them poisoned. He gets them imprisoned. Right now, as we speak, there are dissidents in Russia in, in prison, because not because they committed a crime, but because they disagreed with him. Okay, now if there's a guy you want to, to to defend, there's a big, big problem. And that Africans will, some African leaders who, who are ensconced in power, who don't want to leave, will say, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's how you, you, you run a country. You know, we had here at the office a, I think for a week after the invasion of Ukraine, almost on a daily basis, we had very heated debates about Russia, about Ukraine, about the East, about the West, about the pool between the two. And the, the way I describe it for me is there is an irrational hatred between Russia yeah. and the West. 
it's it's irrational. Yeah. So okay. if you start from that position, that right. says there is no way that you that you're going to be able to put any kind of reasoning to what's going on there. So mm -hmm. what what it is that fuels Putin, and and re realistically speaking, it's not just Putin, right? So it's it's Putin and an entire machinery behind him of war mongers of the, mm -hmm. like Russia does. Mm -hmm. Russia has 195 military academies. <laughs> they, they like yes. just I understand the scale at which war is a right. big part of of the of who they are. So even as the West mm -hmm. has sanctions on Putin empathizes on his cronies on, and to what end what is the hope mm. their hope is that they can foment yeah. which is what sanctions do is that they can foment some kind of of internal strife that will overthrow putin and i'm saying once they have overthrown putin who's There'll there one. right yeah. who's There'll there to photo, come in yeah. after did they not learn this lesson in Iraq? Did they not learn this lesson yeah, in Libya? Libya. Did yeah. they not learn this lesson? So it, they, they just stuck, stuck in the cycle that the, the West mm. tries this, the, the Russia does this, Russia does this, and the West does this. Mm. And this is why it, it kind of creates the city for a shift in the world mm. that then looks outside of the circle because the West is not going to, mm. the West is not going to come out strong. In this environment, because they are already, but you know, can I and Putin is not going to come out strong, so the answer is going to be left of center, right? That's where it's going to be. It's going to be left of center, it's going to come from the Middle East. Uh, well, you know, I just need to, if you remember during the other Cold War, because apparently there are people in Russia who think the Cold War never ended anyway. Yeah. What are these people, what are these people talking about during the Cold War? They the whole world was pretty much divided into pro-Russia or pro-communist sure. and anti-Russia. That's where the whole, that's where the whole t term first, second and third world came from. Exactly. And, and, and the thing is, what worries me is that Africa is constantly, perennially unable to define its own positions. Okay, the thing, I'm going to keep talking about Africa as if it's one, but we have the African Union, or the so-called African Union. I don't know what they do, those guys. <laughs> you know, But we no. need to say, irrespective of what happens out there, these are the interests of Africa. But Africa cannot do that when it constantly needs Russia and China to pump money into it. People don't give you money for nothing, okay? They tell you how you're going to stand, how you go to how are you going to vote on important matters at the United Nations? What what stance are you going to take on matters like this, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So Africa yeah. needs to get to a point where it increases its self reliance on a lot more things than than it currently has, so that it can stand up shoulder to shoulder with anybody and say, "You guys are fighting. That's not our business. This is what we stand for." But right now, we're not able to do that, and that's a problem. Can I scratch at an itch, Pumi, that you you kind of? alluded to just now, and it's maybe something that, Sully, you want to hop into as well, though it's going to be hot water. There's been a, a, a kind of a malaise that's set in across much of the world because we haven't really had major conflicts. You know, the, the exceptions being the Middle East, the exceptions being Rwanda for a while and the Balkans for a little while in the 90s. But really, we haven't had a global war or any kind of uh, desperate kind of live or die situation for many of the countries, especially in the Western world. It's become quite pleasant to live on planet Earth for humans in the last hundred years, or let's say certainly the last 60 or 70 years. Yeah. The, the reason I bring this up is that it seems we kind of forgot that there is still, or maybe we chose to believe that we'd moved on from strongman politics, this idea of these warmongering men, these these warrior leaders who've kind of, they've, they've been the ones who've, whether, whether it's been good or bad, you can argue either way, it's pushed history ahead. And these warmongers, these strong men, these aggressive, you know, territorially ambitious, uh, sometimes narcissistic and egotistic, egomaniacal men who have pushed the world into conflict after conflict after conflict, which only really we've just had a gap for the last bit of living memory. 50 years. Mm -hmm. have, have, we, have we misread human nature and now we're suddenly getting a wake-up call because this is unexpected for many of us. And Pumi and I, you, you were joking, Pums, about how this seems to be taking us backwards when so much other stuff about modern living is taking us forward. Have, have, we, read, have we read it wrong? 
No, I don't think, maybe we've become complacent, but I don't think we've misread uh, human nature. That's why we need systems, you know. Uh, you might not like Barack Obama. When when he went to Ghana soon after he was first elected president, he said, he was talking about Africa, he said, what Africa needs are not strong men. What Africa needs are strong institutions. But of course, we know we have strong institutions in South Africa. If you put schmucks at the top of strong institutions, they become what they are. Look at the NPA, <laughs> okay? So, but the point I'm making is, we do need a world where there is a level of predictability. I know that strong men and all those the kind of people that you've described have almost propelled, you know, the redefining of world relations. I think Russia, the Russian war with the Ukraine is going to redefine how NATO stands vis-a-vis, uh, -vis maybe, I, I, don't, I don't think that the West has an appetite for war. They will not go into no. war unless, unless Russia goes into Latvia or Estonia or any, or, or any of the NATO members, then NATO cannot afford not to do anything to defend them because that's its raison d'être. Right? right but 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 we do need you know a sense of justice we do need a sense of where rights are respected human rights women's rights children's rights we cannot afford to return to a world where a man comes in and says this is how it's going to run then then we might as well uh, allow julius malema to malema to become president of south africa and then you'll see you'll see that it can really be nasty we don't want that anymore but this the thing we have a nation human nature has it there are people like that. Do we can we propel humanity forward without having to kill millions? Is there another way? That we've got to find another way. Pomi, what do you think? We we the the optimist in me says we do have to find another way, but the realist in me says it will take a very long time before we do. What we're talking about, Gareth, you say a large scale war that has involved the entire world. But actually, if you if we if we look at the at the globe and where conflict is at the globe, Syria, Yemen, mm. <laughs> this has been going on for mm. years and years and years, right. simmering in the background. And you know what you see now, because the world is trained and a lot of people were very facetious about the covering of it uh, a week ago, because the world for such a long time has been trained on this Western view of what is happening and therefore the world. So suddenly the refugees coming out of the Ukraine, oh my goodness, we've got to leave prams and food out for them and we've got to like get them, yeah. <laughs> get them on the trains. And the way that African refugees or Middle Eastern refugees are treated is not the same. You know, did you ever think no, that true. America would be calling on Venezuela? Venezuela? for oil and oil, yet yeah. here we are <laughs> you know so those those shifts in in world politics are where we are and that's why i say to you and this this again if any if any of you want to see the article that muzi wrote it was in the sunday times last week hmm. and where the world is is exactly where the world was at the time of the renaissance right they'd had a, very, a big plague. They'd just come out of a big plague. They'd just come out of an incredible kind of warmongering, Far East coming into Europe, right? With the, mm. and, and so we are there now. The technological uh, innovations that we see happening in the world, whether it's just social media or kind of things like Waze and all of that kind of stuff coming out of Israel, the Abraham Accords, a big shift in the way that the world is organizing itself. And this morning we wake up to the news that actually the Ukraine is now putting together a, a document, a non-NATO-led document about how they are not going to join NATO, which is what Putin has been fighting about, right? This could have been done months ago yeah. without bloodshed, without bloodshed. This could have been done yeah. then, and yet... Yeah, we I mean, so I mean we, we, all, we also don't we don't know we don't know the extent to which Vladimir Putin's support actually goes down in Russia. I mean, the average Russian may be completely opposed to this idea. It is their sons, after all, that are having to don uniform and go into the Ukraine um, at his behest. For all we know, it's just purely his uh, his decision, and maybe it was just his decision. And there could be all kinds of reasons for that, and people will speculate in the future what those reasons might have been. But, this but I could, think it's too convenient. Could have been avoided. No, it's too convenient to say Putin. You know, it's too convenient yeah, yeah. to have one bogeyman 
And, right. and no, the, that's the You're point right. that I'm trying to say is that it is not just Putin. So even as you take Putin out of the equation, how, mm. <laughs> how sure are we that even if Putin were assassinated today, how sure are we that this irrational hatred that, that Russia, Russia seems to have for the West is going to be taken away? Yeah, but you know what? I mean, you could say you could have said the same thing about South Africa. It's not Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, take you take him out, and what happens? The thing is, Putin represents a certain Russia. Okay, well, nobody can deny that. Putin he represents a nostalgic Russia, Russia that looks back at the old Soviet Union, and that continues to be heard, and especially older people who continue to be heard at the loss of empire. All right, and he promises them that. I've been to Russia three times. Okay, twice. And people like to say this man makes us makes young men feel proud again to go to war, to be soldiers, to stand for Russia. So there's this strong nationalism. Of course, if he dies, maybe another person will come up, but they might be a, a different person who engages differently with the world. All brands are led. Boris Yeltsin came and danced and drank vodka. We almost like didn't take anything seriously. If you remember, no, we didn't. <laughs> Yes, because he was losing his mind. But anyway. <laughs> and, then, and then Putin came. He's a serious man. He smiles very rarely. But he represents a certain Russia. The question is, which one of the two Russias, the one that wants to engage with the world a, little, a, a bit more positively, that's not paranoid, or the one that, that, that Putin represents that says those people want, the, want to destroy us. That's why they want. They're out to destroy us. And he believes it. He's an, a former KGB person. There's no way that you can take that out of him. But so, we cannot... Yeah. Sully, so, okay. One of the things that, that we've also seen over the past two weeks, right, mm. is as, as, as America then withdraws all, all of the various as the sanctions come in, right? So now no visa, no right. MasterCard, now people right. can transact. And right. immediately, Russia looks to China and says, China has a, yep. you know, China has a, a, a similar transactionary method. This is right. what we are now going to use, right? right. So right. so now China and Russia, and very likely India, right? Mm. Almost a third of the world's population in those three countries. Mm are now forced into a space where they have to trade with each other, where they have to work with each other, and where they have to find a way of existing outside of what has predominantly been kind of a Western way of doing things. Again, I'm going to ask your professional opinion as a reputation specialist, right? How likely is it that when all of this dust settles, Visa and MasterCard are going to be able to come back into Russia and be accepted by the Russian people after the chaos that they caused them by withdrawing. Well, it's not, it's not impossible. Look, I don't think that all of the trade that Russia might get out of China or or, or <clears throat> India or China and India will replace will replace all of the trade that Russia is getting from the West and other parts of the world. It's not going to happen. It's never, it'll never be enough. And all of those three countries need the rest of the world. It's not just a matter of the size of their populations because you may have three, 1.2 billion people or so people in, in India. It doesn't mean all of them can afford to buy Maseratis and all the luxury goods. You know what I'm saying? So I think that I, we will get to it. Punitive measures like sanctions are not meant to last forever. All right. I think there will come a time when, and many Russians are not happy. I don't know how many, but many Russians are not happy with, with what's going because they have interests outside of Russia that they want to maintain. All right. So those brands who are leaving now will, at some point, come back. Obviously, coming back, then we explain, we explain why it's we're coming back into this space. But they will return and they will be accepted. I don't think that the, all of the Russian people will say, yeah, but you walked away from us when we were busy slaughtering Ukrainians. Don't come back here. It's not going to happen. You know, this is how these is. brands walk away I from other brands and they come back. And I think what what tectonic shifts in the world look like is they yeah. look like a necessity that has to be overcome. And right. the necessity that has to be overcome now for the Russians, for the Chinese, is an imperialistic America that seems to be the, the tail wagging the dog when it comes to NATO and how NATO responds 
and the conversations that are being had and again the disintermediation of media where you're not just getting your information from a single source that can be controlled mm -hmm. at a particular where there are many people on the ground sending out videos, sending out their tweets, sending out their YouTube links, all of that. What it creates is it creates it, it creates a rift right. that allows okay. opportunity. That allows opportunity. And more and more, at the moment, a lot of countries may depend on the West. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying to you is that the, the reliance on the West is mm -hmm. becoming eroded by the experience that people are having of the West. People are asking themselves, oh my God, if we're all moving on to Apple Pay and America can just decide to shut down Apple Pay, oh, do, is this really what I want to get into? So yeah. more people are now starting to say, maybe I need to be looking at cryptocurrencies sure. so that I'm, I'm, but now, I'm not... But now, but now Joe Biden's even trying to regulate cryptocurrencies, which frankly I think is an outrage. I mean, you know, Justin Trudeau did this thing where he seized the assets of people who were donating to the trucker convoy. And that, mm. to me, was the first sign that mm. these guys, um, even Canada, you know, one of the most milk toast places on earth, right. if they would behave like autocratic dictators and shut down people's channels for income or channels for sustenance, then you know you're in a dangerous situation. How much of this is to be put at the feet? Because it's convenient in some ways for him. But how much of this can be laid at the feet of Joe Biden? You know, he finally decided uh, two days ago. I think ultimately what many people were saying he should have done from the beginning and, and, and basically decided America is not going to import any more Russian oil. But he did say by the end of 2022, which may be too late. I mean, that gives, uh, you know, it gives Vladimir Putin a lot of income for the next couple of months straight out of the U.S. So they are funding his war in some way. How much of this is Joe Biden's fault? And how much are we seeing the decline and fall of the American empire that Pumi referred to just a second ago? Well, there's no doubt that there are changes happening. There's a, a, a global realignment that's happening. By the time this thing ends, things, certain things are going to function differently. But it doesn't mean that America will no longer exist in terms of the, the influence that it has. It will influence maybe some of the world, but not all of the world. And America is aligned with NATO, with Western Europe. The, the, there are still forces to be to, to reckon with. I mean, okay, we, we've seen um, what, uh, Germany now, which 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 announced to the whole world up at, on, to, on, t on tabletops and rooftops to say it's so it's not going to nuclear anymore. So it's, it's going to rely on natural gases and all that. Now they're turning around to say maybe we made a mistake there. But they will find other sources. There will be relationships with Russia. There will be relationships with the world. There will be different relationships. We don't know what kind of relationships because the the sands are still are still I have not settled yet. You know, so let's or the dust is not settled. So let's see what happens. What the world is going to look like. Can we blame everything on on on, on Biden? I don't think so. I mean, the Russia Putin's anger with the West started long ago. Maybe there are certain things that Biden could have done to, but he cannot act on his own because it's not just about America. It's about the West. It's about NATO. Is I think this thing is a whole. It's about interest, really. At the end of it, it's about interest. Of course, NATO, the security. There are security issues. There are there are economic, financial uh, issues as well. Uh, NATO wants to be as close to, as possible to Russia, but it wants to embrace those guys who were part of the Soviet Union. And obviously, Russia is not is not happy with that. Uh, will rest, Will NATO then announce? Well, are they going to be the next one to say, okay, that's fine, fine, fine. We're not going to go this far beyond a certain line. But but the world will continue. People are going to lose lives, jobs. Like we've had COVID nineteen now, but some of us are going to survive. We, you, the three of us are still here post COVID. How many people have died of COVID? The world has, is now doing things differently. Look at this interview and many other things that we do online. Because but there will be an, a realignment. It's not possible that after this war things will stay the same. But we can't blame it on one factor. It's a mouthful, but I, I kind of largely agree with you. Is it inevitable? And is China playing the best long game here of all? Because this opens the door for them to uh, make moves on, on Taiwan, which has been long yeah. suggested as the ultimate goal in the short term for them. In the long term, to establish their own kind of new Eastern hegemony. Um, are, th are these things inevitable? Pumi, what do you think? You know, so Sally said interests, and I said last week, and I'm going to say it again, it's not my quote, um, it's actually 
from one of the civil rights leaders, that there are no permanent enemies and there are no permanent friends in politics, yes. only permanent interests. Mm -hmm. So as long as we understand that the only thing that is permanent is going to be interests in this experience, when the dust settles, the interests of the various players are what is going to remain. So you talk about China and their interest in Taiwan, very possible that they're going to make a move for it. We talk about Joe Biden saying we're not going to be importing Russian oil anymore, but his interest and the, the thirst of America for oil has led him to what used to be an enemy. But again, because there are no permanent enemies, now they yeah. are talking to Venezuela. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of sending their oh. money to Russia, they're going to be sending their money to Venezuela. You yeah. know, so NATO, <laughs> even the Ukraine, you see the Ukraine who has been wanting to join NATO because of where they are and where their interest is in self-preservation, they have decided that they're going to put together a document that says, we will never join NATO. Yeah. So it's Look, going to be about interest. I absolutely. It's always about interest. I think that um, I, I do agree that China, you know, Hong Kong was a test case for China to see how the world is going to react. When China goes for Taiwan, and I, I agree with you, it's not, it's not evitable that it will go for, 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 for Taiwan. The world is not going to do anything because China's military might is so huge. Nobody wants to go face to face with China on the, militarily. The West has no appetite for that, as I said. And, and again, I just one more point I want to raise is when the, 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 that journalist was Kishok, Kishok, Kishok was killed by the Saudis and, you know, in that terrible way. And America looked the other way. It was also Ashoki. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. It was also the interest of America in Saudi Arabia. They're like, well, are, we, are we going to lose this relationship because of this one person? Especially given that the, the person who's highly implicated in this is a top guy. The next future, this guy, this young prince now is going to be the next leader of, of Saudi Arabia unless something happens to him over the next 30, 50 years. And they don't want to go head to head, head, to head with that. It's because their interests don't align with fighting for human rights. But what the rest of the world is looking at is they are looking at it what an unreliable friend America seems to be. Mm. Yeah. That's what they're seeing. They're seeing America as an unreliable friend. If you look at the chaotic way in which they mm. left Afghanistan, if you look at the chaos that they left behind, in, yeah. you know, in everywhere where they've been, the chaos they leave behind, people are asking themselves, do you want this guy on your co <laughs> in your side, in no. your corner? Yes, exactly. Uh, just, they've, uh, let down, they've let down all of their allies. They are no longer a trustworthy partner to have in the world. America's credibility as a partner yeah. is dashed. Yeah. And you know, up to not so long ago, it was very, very powerful. It was still the best argument to be aligned with that part of the world. A, a Canadian friend of mine used to describe America as a moving target. When you point out to something bad they're doing, somebody else will show you something good they're doing. But it's true that America has lost its moral high ground long ago. It's really hard for them to stand up to say to the world, this is how it's going to run, because there's always going to be somebody, somebody who will say, aha, you say this is how it's going to run. What about Iraq? What about Afghanistan? What about this? And what about mm. that? And that's the same and, thing. About and so, since we know that nothing hates a vacuum more than politics. Yeah. <laughs> Where there's a vacuum, some, someone, some new power is going to step into that sure. vacuum. I want and another one more thing. A diplomat friend of mine likes to say that countries have to decide. You know, if you have a, a one of those I looking less, uh, is it a fair cake here? Not fair cake. One that you to see a telescope, but a telescope. So countries have to decide whether they look at the world. So the one side of the telescope has the the the, the values of the country, the the, the the yeah, the basic values. The other one is the interest. Do you look at the world? from the perspective of your interests alone or do you look at the world from the perspectives of a value values in other words when people do wrong and it doesn't even though your interests are are, are would be protected or enhanced by what they're doing even if it's wrong do you say but our values don't allow that or do you say you know what dump the values here the interests are more important and i think that's a challenge of many countries when do you turn your telescope around to look at the world in terms of values when do you turn it around to look at in terms of, in terms of your interests alone
Guys, uh, just to bring it home for a second, because a lot of people are asking this question, Cyril was meant to address us last night. Did anybody watch that? Because I don't even know if there was an address. Uh, anybody? Really? I don't know. I heard something. Someone said to me he was going to address us last night. I didn't watch. I, I'm, I, wasn't, I didn't set a reminder or anything, because you need to for him. And if he is going to suggest... I have no power. Isn't it time for him to... Yeah, exactly. That's probably why I didn't do it, because he knew no one would be watching, because we can't. Um, but isn't it time for him to announce an end to this state of disaster and to just put away the masks? I mean, every other country in the world is pretty much doing that already. Why I are we so far the, behind? What are we doing? Where, in this country where I live, three weeks ago, no masks, mm -hmm. no no, no checking whether people have been vaccinated. And it's, we, we're back to normal. You know? And it, people who wear masks are individuals who decide, oh, no, no, I still want to protect myself. But the world has not come to an end. We don't wear masks anymore here. I think South Africa should get to a point where they say, well, look, you know, people must take personal responsibilities. You know what this thing can do. You know what it's done in the past if it's this thing. Uh, but now we're not going to restrict people from doing business anymore, from um, traveling, from doing the things they need to do. I think we, we as people now need to adopt the – we need to take the, the, the initiative. We should remove our masks and only put them on if asked to. Our default position should be everywhere in the world. They have now realized this was a stupid farce in the first place. It is time now for if I walk into a shop, unless I'm asked, I will not put it on. It will be in my yeah. pocket, but I don't see any danger to anyone else. It's time to mm. rid ourselves of this fashion accessory, which we've been carrying around for no good reason for the, I mean, every doctor that there is including Fauci now has come out with this revised opinion that now all we've been doing is putting on a bit of theater so it's time to give it up and and if the president won't make that decision because he can't make any decisions then we'll start doing it ourselves and until someone asks me to put it on I'm going to keep it off yeah, I, I think, again, for the kind of changes that have to, have to happen in South Africa, South Africans have to stand up to, together. Where I am now, people said, it's enough. We don't want these things. They, there was a lot of strong civil society voice that said, we don't want these things anymore. But in South Africa, we, 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 we sorry, am I allowed to say bitch about it? Mm, oh, sorry, yeah, sure. oops. Okay, we bitch about it on social media. We, but we don't go into the streets and hold hands and say, stop. They ain't, we've seen it in the past. When South Africans get together, and the ANC fears that, and in one voice, they say to the ANC, this far, no further. The ANC will pull back. Any closing statements from you, Pumi? I, I love what Sonny is saying. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of civil society taking action, whether it is in showing up to vote or whether it is in joining an organization or simply just in your little corner of the world, organizing and helping and changing your little corner of the world. But that's that really is what it's about. It's about all the individuals coming together and saying, this is what we want, and this is how we want it to be for the government. You know, if so if organizing is what it is, organizing is what it is. But it's it's up to the it's up to the citizens of the country to make the country go where they want it to go. It's not the leaders. It's not the leaders of the country. Mm. It is the citizens that tell those people what they want and what they need. Yeah. And just a, a, a final thought, Sully, you're in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. We're in the Southern Hemisphere. Do we need to dig nuclear bunkers now or do we need to worry about that further down the road? <laughs> <laughs> Two things. Where, where, you know, when I moved to this place where I live now, when I went to announce myself, it's almost like in the African traditional sense. You say, "This is who I am. I'm going to live yeah. here." They, one of the things they gave me, which I have right there next to me, is up is a box of pills in case there's a nuclear attack. And really? when I got, what yes, do the pills do? Do they kill well, you? We don't. You don't take them the immediately. The, gov the government will. Eating. The government will tell you when to use them. They're in my in my drive. This is a, this this thing here. Yeah. So, so they, they say you don't open them until we tell you to open. When there's a nuclear attack, you're going to need that. This is what they, they gave they, me. They, <laughs> so, it contains, uh, yeah, it contains iodine because your thyroid tends to collect nuclear material faster than anything else, radioactive yeah. material. So you can you can dis disperse that quicker with the iodine. Correct. So my last word would be, I really hope that at some point soon more South Africans wake up to the Ponzi scheme that has been the political environment we live in South Africa. Mm -hmm. we, need, we, we can't change if we don't wake up first and realize that we've been taken for a ride.
And and Sully, you said when the government tells you you take those pills, if we've learned anything from the last two and a half years, let us not just listen to government when they tell us to do things. So far, there is not one government that I can think of that's done exactly what they should have done with this whole COVID thing. It's all been overreactions, the only possible exception being Sweden. Um, maybe we shouldn't be listening to them at all anymore. Well, I mean, human societies are always led. I think the, I think the question is to what extent is civil society uh, being given enough room, uh, space in the room to influence the decisions. Where I live now, people do. Uh, the democracy here is really run by the people. The people decide if I, we don't want, I promise you. I, know, okay? I, went to, I went and went lined up for two vaccine shots, which it turns out now are probably going to be unnecessary even for travel. Yeah. Um, so I, did, I did three. I waste of time. You did three. Yeah, Booms, you did two, hey? Yeah. 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 Well, you see, I mean, if what if what if they were actually trying to yeah. uh, to take us out of this? Implant a chip on us. <laughs> that, that's, but, but that's what I'm saying. It's not it's not one or the other. I think that we need some kind of organization. Human societies throughout history have always there's some form of organization, rules of of play and all that. But it doesn't mean that you make those rules and go home and watch TV and not get involved in civil life, which is what we, we, this is the mistake we made in South Africa. We have to remain committed, interested, and we may have to keep to keep speaking truth to power. Well, we've given too much to the to the politicians in South the Africa. Final, too much. The final word comes from one of our listeners. Preach it, Sully. And Sully, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> for me, thank you uh, very much. I love we'll you guys. See. You're you're going to be handling the burning platform without me from next week, Pums. Uh, for Is a it week. next week? Yeah, so oh. we're on Wednesday, so it's all happening. Oh. Sully, thanks again, sir. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Pumi, don't crush people, please. I don't. <laughs> I don't. You've just had an hour with me. Were you crushed? Were no. you crushed? I was, exactly. I was, I was respectful. <laughs> <laughs> come here with facts, then you'll be treated as such. Come, okay. here, with a, come here with a clown face. Have All a right. nice day. Love you guys. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We will see you.